Metro in Thiel in the Netherlands. Welcome with me, Ron van Eyck. Now we cannot show the camera <laughs> around, but you will see him in a minute, who is responsible for the international market uh, development of Energie Sprong and also one of the co-founders. Then Jasper van den Munkhoff, who is a director at Energie Sprong, also one of the founders. The event will be moderated by my good friend, Emenegilda Bocabella. She's uh, leading the energy practice at Global Council, and she actually took the effort to come here from Berlin this morning. So let's start, Ron. What made, your what made you found Energie Sprong in the first place? Can you talk about that? Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Ron. I'm with uh, Energie Sprong. Um, and most of you uh, probably know us from the guys that have been pushing very deep uh, industry produced uh, net zero retrofits for uh, a couple of years now in a number of countries. Uh, and we are that, but today I'm not gonna talk uh, exactly about sort of the innovative edge of retrofit and that we have been preoccupying with ourselves ourselves with uh, over the past years. I'm going to focus on sort of the wider perspective here and uh, especially with regards to this renovation wave that uh, the European institutions are preparing to give a real push to uh, to, to retrofits in Europe. Um, so that's what what I'll, what I'll talk a little bit about today. Now Let's start at the, the problem, right? If you look at the existing building stock in Europe, we know that uh, by 2050, about 80% of the buildings that are there today will still be there tomorrow. Um, and these buildings consume significant amounts of uh, fossil fuels, especially to heat them. Uh, so we know need to go in and fix them. Um, and to make matters uh, more complicated, uh, today we're still building uh, houses that we connect to fossil fuel grids, right? So we connect to the grass grids or uh, maybe other forms of fossil fuels, heating, district heating networks. And we're just exaggerating the problem because we also know that within five or 10 years, we, you know, we know that we need to find another resource for these houses. And except for uh, the Dutch government, there is not a national ban across Europe in any other country um, to say, okay, as of today, new houses and new buildings are no longer allowed to be connected to a fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, so, um, so this is a problem that we should address in any case, but I'll focus mainly on, um, on the retrofit part. So um, this renovation wave, uh, what are we going to do about this? And many people say, look, the challenge is so big that we need to uh, use all options available to us because we'll need them in order to, uh, to, uh, to get you know, to, the, uh, to, the, to, the pro to the to the solution of this problem but we don't need all the solutions that are there. We just need the right solution. And uh, today I'll explain why the right solution uh, is in, in the end very simple. We need to bring the energy performance of the existing building stock down to a level where they can be heated with low temperature heating. And then we use heat pumps to provide that heating with. So now I'll explain why that is the solution we should fully focus on in Europe. So if we look at how energy is brought to buildings today. Uh, basically, we have an electricity grid that is powered uh, with uh, a mix of uh, carbon-free uh, generation and, and uh, carbon-intensive generation, and that provides electricity to our homes. And then most homes have a second source of energy that comes to their, uh, to their uh, uh, most homes or buildings that comes to the building um, to provide heating. And often that is fossil fuel. Um, uh, sometimes it's a district heating network, but in any case, 75% of all that energy that is being created, uh, brought to the house is uh, based out of fossil fuels. Now, the thing here is that on the electricity part, we have a pretty clear path to uh, a carbon-free mix, right? We've been making huge steps over the last uh, uh, years and, we're, and, and the pace at uh, which we build new uh, renewable and generation capacity is increasing. So we have a clear path towards, um, towards a CO2-free uh, electricity mix. We don't have a clear path when it comes to the fossil fuel component that provides energy to our houses. So the obvious thing to do here would say, okay, why don't we just increase uh, the, the power mix with loads of CO2 uh, capacity and we'll use that to heat our homes. Um, that in, in itself looks a pretty straightforward solution, but let's look more in detail about how that would work out. So the thing here is that absolute numbers matter. Right, so if you look at the total energy that buildings uh, consume for heating, and when I say heating is space heating, but also hot water and a bit of cooking even, 
it's about 25% of our total energy consumption in Europe. And total, I mean everything, transport, industry, power generation, the whole thing, right? So the absolute volume of energy that we're trying to decarbonize here is enormous. But it gets even more complicated because this is on an annual basis. But if you actually take a winter month, um, the amount of energy in a January month that we consume to he provide heating to buildings is actually almost or half the total energy we consume. And this is where the problem gets really complicated. Uh, because if you think about this solution, right, adding a lot of green electricity or carbon free electricity to the grid and using that to provide heating with, the winter months in particular are going to be a huge challenge. I'll try to explain a little bit how that would go. So this is kind of the, the profile of the energy use for heating, providing heating to buildings over the year, right? In the winter months, it's high. In the summer months, it's low because there is a bit of base load, which is basically uh, hot water and a bit of cooking, and the rest is just space heating uh, that's added up. So this is kind of what that profile of energy consumption over a year looks like. Now, if you compare that to the red bar below, um, that the red bar represents uh, what the total electricity production, not just green, but everything, the total installed capacity produces in Europe. And in a winter month, uh, the total electricity, current electricity production in Europe is about 300 terawatt hours. In a winter month, the total energy consumption for heating buildings is about 700 terawatt hours, right? So this is about two and a half times the total installed capacity. So if you think about the amount of additional generation we would have to add to decarbonize the electricity grid and, and make that the source of heating for our existing building stock, that is all already quite an infeasible proposition altogether. Um, especially when you realize that the, the current electricity mix isn't fully carbon free. So, you know, 40% of that mix, we still have to sort of decarbonize as well. So the amounts that we're talking about are just becoming infeasible, right? Because this would be kind of the share that we would have to add in terms of production capacity to meet that winter demand that way. Now, if we would look at what is, is out there that could help us um, provide that amount of electricity though, right? So it's been a battle over the past sort of decade and a half, you know, which options would, uh, would prevail and it's kind of settled, right? We know that solar and wind have continued to go down and are now at levels, uh, right? 11 cents per kilowatt hour for the last wind park in Portugal and 45 is where where the, the bigger wind, uh, wind parks are at, um, that is the cheaper options. And we've, we continue to see a, 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 a cost decrease there. Um, so, uh, and if you compare that to, for instance, biomass to make electricity out of, um, that's much more expensive and new, new nuclear capacity has become completely unaffordable. So we know that this is kind of the mix that we need to work with. And then people might think, hey, but there's also geothermal and hydro and waste we can use. But the thing there is with geothermal, you know, Continental Europe isn't Iceland, so there is very limited potential there. Uh, when it comes to hydro, we already almost explored everything there is, and with the local impacts, uh, new dams would create. The expansion potential is very limited, and the same goes for waste. Uh, most waste is already incinerated and made energy out of, so there isn't much scope to increase on that basis further. So this is kind of the main thing we're, we're stuck with, or we, we, we are going to use going forward. So... Again, that same energy demand for, for heating, right? So what, what's the plan here? We're going to build huge amounts of, uh, of renewable capacity to see if we can meet, meet that demand in that way. Um, you know, if you compare that again to the, what's, what's already out there, that is a quite an infeasible proposition, um, especially when you consider that the moments when we need that energy is actually the moments where at least the solar energy will be available least to us. So, you know, we would even need more installed capacity to match that demand. Um, over winter periods. And the thing is, it's actually even worse than this picture suggests because these values kind of represent the amounts that we consume if you average on it on a monthly basis, right? Then the ratio of the 300 to 700 that I mentioned before is kind of where you end up. But the problem is there will be a few weeks where it gets really cold in Europe and the heating demand in those weeks will even be much higher than you know, what you will see on a month, monthly average. So that means we would need even more electric capacity to get to those volumes to meet the demand in those months. Um, if, the, if the previous proposition wasn't already completely infeasible, this surely is. So we're not 
going to be going to be able to build out this kind of a capacity based on what you see is already there. And I'm not even talking about the grid constraints that you would face, which make it kind of a showstopper in its own right. So there are two problems, right? The, the absolute amo, uh, amount of energy that it will require and electricity it will require and time of use, right? So we use less in summer, more in winter. So what about storage? Can we um, generate stuff in the summertime, store it, and then deploy it in winter time so we don't have that peak capacity. Let's have a look. What options are kind of out there, right? Because we can then reduce it from this total production capacity to this. That would be great. If that would run throughout the year, then the access we'd, we'd run in winter and that would help us, um, you know, at least reducing it a significant amount. So let's look at what's, what other options would be there. So the, Pumped hydro, right? That's the first option we, we would have a look at. You, you pump hydro in the summertime and you let it run down in wintertime and it, it's pretty good efficiency uh, and uh, we've been using it for a long time and it works well. So the Joint Research Center did um, a study where they looked at the potential of the increase that we could have. Uh, and in Europe, it's about 12 terawatt hours left of uh, installed pump hydro capacity we could add in order to uh, make sure that, um, uh, yeah, that we could uh, add some storage capacity. 12 terawatt hours is not uh, nothing, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know how that compares to what we need. Um, what about batteries, uh, either stationary or in cars? Just to give you a feel for what batteries can do, if we would switch all cars uh, in Europe today to full electric battery-driven cars with significant range, we would end up with a storage capacity of about 15 terawatt hours. I mean, that's a lot of energy, but if you compare that to the amounts that we're looking at in, the, in sort of the heating demand, it is completely irrelevant, right? The, the amounts we would have to move between seasons is more in the order of 2000 terawatt hours. So these kind of options are great for grid balancing and kind of local peak shaving, but they are completely, completely irrelevant when we're looking at trying to solve this problem. Now, until this part of the presentations, companies like Shell would be very enthusiastic in agreeing with us and they would jump to the conclusion, yes, that's why we need hydrogen because that is a, a, an energy carrier that can really supply the volumes that we need that we're talking about. So let's have a look at this, right? So the idea is you create hydrogen out of uh, renewable electricity. You do that particularly in the summertime, you store the hydrogen and then in wintertime and you run that, you, you run it in the gas system. And then in wintertime, you, you use that storage that you build up over the summertime and you, you can push that additional hydrogen into the gas system so we can heat our homes and our buildings. The problem is that it costs a lot of energy or you lose a lot of energy by converting uh, renewable electricity into hydrogen and then providing it to people's homes. You, so in effect, to provide one uh, unit of uh, heat to a, a building, you need 1.7 units of electricity. So if you wanna match this demand with hydrogen, you need 1.7 times the amount of energy that you need to deliver, which basically means that this is now the total amount this is now the total amount of energy that you'd uh, be looking to um, generate, but now not just in winter months, but throughout the year. Now, that in itself, again, becomes a completely infeasible proposition. But the other thing you have to realize is that the cost of um, energy for consumers would go up dramatically, right? So, uh, CE did a pretty good study about it uh, two years ago, and they say if you would convert it to you convert to hydrogen now, uh, people would have four times the amount of energy uh, cost uh, compared to a gas connection today. And if you would go to the absolute optimum scenario, right, cheap, cheap electricity, Morocco solar fields, huge scale, you would still end up at a double, the doubling of the energy cost for consumers. So the hydrogen-based system is also a really inefficient and very inexpensive, very expensive alternative. So we can take that off the table as well. Again, comparing it to the, to the existing electricity uh, production capacity, this is completely irrealistic. Now, how about reducing the energy demand? 
I'm sure this works. If you look at what we are, you know, the, if the, the top line is kind of where we are today and you would do what we are doing today, like the typical BC label retrofit, you put a bit of double glazing in, maybe a bit of roof uh, insulation. You cut, realistically, you cut uh, energy consumption with maybe 25%, right? It helps, it's, it's an option, but you still see that the, the amount of energy you're talking about is still very far out of reach to be generating with clean power. You can push that further, right? You go really, really far and um, you would do what I have referred to here as an A-label. I mean, A-labels uh, or A-plus labels take into account heat pumps and, and solar as well. So, but I'm just talking about the energy performance, right? I'm just talking about the insulation level that you would, you would acquire. So you push it really, really far uh, and you would uh, cut energy consumption uh, with maybe 50 or 60%. Um, which is obviously a good step, but still you're looking at huge amounts of additional uh, power. Um, especially again, when comparing to what we have today. So what are we going to do? Because none of these solutions in its own right seems to deliver the solution that we actually can realize. I mentioned the inefficiency that the hydrogen system has, right? 100 units of heat provided to a home requires about 160 units of renewable electricity because of the conversion losses on the way. If you compare that to the direct electric route, right, to sort of just generate a lot of power and heat the home directly, you have a bit of transmission losses, but you are close to one-on-one. -on -one. But there is this thing called a heat pump, which can help us here because a heat pump is kind of a smart device that takes energy out of thermal energy out of the ambient air. So it uses a bit of power to run a compressor and it has an agent that runs around and does smart thing with thermodynamics. And then basically it converts 35 units of generated power into hundred units of heating delivered to the house. This is great, right? So why do we just do this? Put a lot of um, uh, renewable capacity in there, put all heat pumps in every, in every building and we're done because it can deliver warm water, it can deliver heating. Uh, this looks great because we would basically end up here, right? So even slightly below a very well insulated house because of that efficiency factor in terms of the amount of capacity that we would need. So this is very, very compelling. However, there is a problem because if you would, if you would just put a heat pump in existing buildings, um, it works differently from the current uh, fossil fuel uh, based solutions, right? If you take a gas boiler, it has a huge capacity for heating. It can produce, let's say, 30 kilowatts of, of heating uh, instantly. So if you get up in the morning and you have an old house and it's cold, you just switch on the boiler and it heats the house up in like 15 minutes. And, you know, when you go away, you switch it, you turn it down again. When you're going to sleep, you turn it down again. So it works on an on-off basis in, in houses typically. Um, and that works well, right? We, we're used to it. This is how we operate it. And it provides a fairly comfortable living experience. If you do this with a heat pump, however, it's not quite the same thing because a heat pump provides lower temperature uh, heating. And lower temperature heating means that it can't, uh, can't heat a cold house as quickly as a gas boiler can. And that means that you can't just switch it on and off and have a comfortable living experience. Um, if you use a heat pump, you basically let it run 24 seven, right? It has a low temperature off, uh, uh, heating off, um, offset. And as long as the house doesn't lose too much heat, that works really well. But if you would have to run it in a very poorly insulated home, you would have to use a huge heat pump that would run continuously. And the amount of energy that you would actually consume increases significantly, mitigating the, the efficiency gains that you would have. So this doesn't work. So what you have to do is a combination of the two. You insulate it, the house, to, to make it suitable for the low temperature heating, and then you put a heat pump in. And then the numbers become really, really compelling because now we don't need 100 units of heat to get that house comfortable anymore. We need, let's say, 33 units of heat. And because we use the efficiencies of the heat pump, we're only left with 11 units of renewable generation that we need uh, instead of the 100 uh, whatever we had in the previous options. And then this picture obviously becomes really interesting because now we're ending up with very, very low amounts of uh, renewable additional capacity that we need to create. And their storage amounts that we can work with, with maybe, bio, uh, with, with maybe a bit of hydrogen, maybe a bit of biogas, uh, or even some other uh, uh, hydro uh, becomes in the or order of magnitudes that we can work with. So this system could work and, and, and will work if we, if we organize it collectively in that way. 
By the way, one thing, if I've, I've been using heat pump as a sort of in a single house to keep it very simple, but you know, that's, we can also, the same applies for ground sort heat pump that are working in, in small district heating networks. Eh? So it's, I just want to clarify that that covers the whole range. Um, my time is almost up. I just want to finish on, the, on, on this note, um, the consumer, right? So if you have a consumer, um, you want to, they, they will have to do something about uh, maintaining and upgrading their homes, right? So they, they need to replace their windows and their boilers at some point and so on. You want to bring them in a position where they are actually able to, um, where they're actually able to have a more compelling solution and say, okay, when we, when we do big maintenance, the, the obvious choice needs to become, we insulate it so the house, not in theory, but in reality is suitable for low temperature heating and we put a heat pump in there, right? So the propositions that are shaping up around this and the incentives that government give to people should all be focusing on driving them to do these kind of things, especially when they wanna do big renovations to their house anyway, because it's just required for, for maintenance. So to sum it up, if you look at the, if you look at basically the energy mix uh, for heating uh, buildings, uh, then you know, there is a bit of scope for, for waste uh, incineration and CHP. There is a bit of scope for geothermal and we should use it when it's there, right? There is no problem. But all the fossil stuff, uh, we should just convert to this. And when you look at what's here, uh, there is a bit of what I, I've put the share that is currently used as biomass for heating and I could put the share that's currently already direct, directly heated. Um, there is no good reason to also not convert the direct, direct electric heating to low temperature heating, right? Use much less electricity, take a load off the winter power demand uh, for those places as well. And the same goes for biomass, right? I understand there is a rural areas where this makes sense, but you also want to use that biomass in places where you need more high temperature heating and reduce the energy demand there and switch them to low temperature heating as well. And then when it comes to hydrogen and biogas, you know, this is great for storage or for high temperature process heating and use it there, but don't start building an infrastructure or a whole energy system for heating houses around, around those options because it's inefficient, it's not scalable, and it's too expensive. We're done. In a, I mean, that was the end of my story. And I guess the message here is the EU should take the lead in saying this is the main option because the longer they're ambiguous and saying, oh, all these things are kind of interesting and uh, we should uh, you know, push all kinds of forms of innovation there and you, know, you never know. No, you do know. This is what we need to do. Insulate so that houses can go to low temperature heating and put a heat pump in there so that the electricity efficiency gains are enormous. And it's important for the EU to come out and say this because the longer there is ambiguity in countries or, in mem or in, with people and with industry, the longer it takes to converge all the innovation efforts to what needs to happen. Um, and that's my cue to switch over to Jasper because with Energiesprong, we've been trying to push solutions that will fit this, uh, fit this approach very well. And Factory Zero has been one of the leading companies in trying to create new products that make it more compelling, cheaper, and easier for consumers to actually make the switch. So I'll switch to Jasper. All right. Thank you, Ron. I'm going to do the same jumping here over the cables. Um, yeah, so um, welcome all to Factory Zero. Uh, I'm one of the founders of Factory Zero. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm going to try to give you a bit of perspective on, on how, how we think we can get heat pumps installed quickly into homes uh, over the coming years. To give a bit of perspective, um, Factory Zero is a, let's say, startup scale up. We started in 2017 and did the first production uh, batch in, uh, like real production batch in 2018. Um, so, so this is just starting. And the connection between Energy Sprung and Factory Zero is that we kind of started this whole company out of frustration. Um, uh, together with Ron, we, we, we founded Energy Sprung, and I saw that it's almost impossible to get the current general contractors and installers to, um, to adopt these new technologies, to adopt new business models. Um, so we thought, you know, let's give it a go and do it ourselves. So I give you a small presentation about, I think, five to seven minutes about where we are at the moment, and then we'll do the factory tour because I think that's the exciting part, you know, of, of, of how this whole thing is built. Um, so I'm going to try and pull the presentation up. So why we started? 
Um, this is the typical, uh, the typical uh, installation we saw before we started. So all the components are there. There's a heat pump, a heat recovery ventilation system, there's an inverter, and there's a lot of piping. And there is no management of this machine because all these different technology and all these different brands, they can't speak the same language at the moment. And, you know, this is too expensive. This would cost you around 25 to 30,000 euros to get installed in your home. So um, this machinery was too expensive, it was too big, it was hard to monitor together. Um, because you can't monitor it, you can actually, you can't give a guarantee on the performance of these machines. And if you install a heat pump, you really want it to perform. Because it's an investment, you can pay back on your energy bill savings. It has hardly any building integration, except for the screws you put to the wall, and it has a long installation time. So what we came up with was um, the energy pot. And that encompasses everything you just saw on the wall in a box of one square meter and two meter, two meter high. And um, we, uh, we, we produce it in a way that it can be building integrated. So what you see is that eh, if an installer comes in, he puts everything to the wall, but then still, you know, that stuff has to be covered in one way or the other because it's noisy, et cetera. So we put a cover on, and this is typically our outside unit, so that can be integrated within the aesthetics of the whole road or the whole retrofit you do. Uh, and here you see this 120, uh, 120 home uh, uh, project where, where kind of this is adapted to the aesthetics of the architect. Uh, in other projects, they do it slightly different and they put it under the canopy. Um, and this was the first, the first module we started producing. Um, we saw a lot of demand for new build coming up because the Dutch government actually banned fossil fuel new build. So most of new builds homes at the moment are equipped with a heat pump. Um, so the whole package we build in a way that can sink through the roof um, when it's been new built. And this is also used for retrofits at the moment. Um, this is kind of how it goes. Uh, so it comes with a truck with eight, eight of these modules. Uh, you see them underneath uh, on a truck. Um, they get hoisted into a, a slot which exactly fits the panel we provide. And um, end of the day, we can, eight of, we can have eight of these modules installed, equipped um, and, and running. Um, and that is, you know, just imagine this, this is one guy on site who does this. So it's, it's a huge increase in install time or a huge decrease in install time, I have to say. Uh, and that means a lot of less cost because most of the cost of, uh, of, the, uh, of, of such a new technology and, and installing heat pumps is in the installer who has to do a lot of work. Um, this is how it looks when it's ready. Uh, then the last version I want to show you is a facade mounted version where um, in the gray, um, uh, in the gray uh, areas, um, you see that that heat pump actually breathes through the facade. So, um, so it can produce uh, the heat and hot water for, uh, for apartment buildings. So that comes to four versions. It's uh, the external unit. It's an what we call an attic mounted uh, unit. We have a flat roof unit and we've got the facade mounted unit and they all come at 90,900 or 11,900, which is a fixed price, which is about, I think, half of what you would get if you, uh, if you would call the installer at the moment. Um, this comes with a screen. So we monitor about 60 data points every five minutes in the module. Uh, and that has been, um, um, uh, been projected on a screen in the living room. So this is normally the thermostat people have. They can, they can put the temperature up and down. They can, they can ramp up the ventilation if they want. Um, but it, on, the, on the bottom side, you see that um, you can also see the energy performance. And if that is on par with the expected performance of the home. So every day, you see the, sm the green smiley in the screen. If that green smiley starts to turn orange, people start to look at what the home is actually doing and if the whole the whole uh, energy module is performing. And then they can see, hmm, I'm actually overusing in thermal, uh, thermal heating. So maybe my windows are open too much, or maybe some other reason there is, or maybe I need a new fridge. fridge. But you see a lot of impact on that, just that direct feedback on the energy performance of the home to lower the, the overall uh, energy use. All that data also goes to the cloud. And on top is kind of all the energy uses we see. So that's the household energy use. It's the solar production. It's the use of the heat pump and the use of the ventilation set, uh, system, et cetera. And the other thing we focus on is the air interior quality. Um, uh, so you see, uh, we, we measure CO2 levels. We measure hydrogen uh, or hydrogen, sorry. We measure um, um, uh, humidity, uh, temperature, and uh, VOCs. And we, at the moment, automatically uh, ramp up the ventilation levels if the CO2 goes up. 
Uh, we have sensors in the bedroom, in the living room, and in the bathroom uh, to kind of steer the ventilation system. So the interior air quality is always uh, what you need. And uh, remotely, we can also manage those machines. I'll come to that um, now. This is uh, normally build it up uh, nicely, uh, but um, you see what we basically do is heating, hot water, um, ventilation, and a solar inverter. Uh, and that is what normally an installer will bring to your home. Now, we monitor and maintain that. So everything which goes out of this factory will be maintained for 10 years, which is quite easy because we exactly know what we shipped. So we know what's there um, and, and we, can, you know, we can keep track of those machines. Um, and by monitoring, we have every five minute data from that machine. So we can exactly say, hey, something's going wrong here. And if people call us, you know, it might be cold. We can actually log into the machine and see what happens. So most of the problems we can remotely solve. Then because you monitor and maintain this, uh, we can also do energy and indoor climate performance warranties. And that is something quite revolutionary. So we, we actually guarantee people that the energy, uh, that the energy model uh, will, will perform to its spec and that the air quality in that home will be okay. The last thing what we do is project integration and delivery uh, and we commission the machines ourselves because we, we produce them, we ship them, we place them on site and we, and we take care that it runs. Um, uh, we actually kind of um, take the role of the installer in an oil project out. Um, and it also gives us a lot of comfort because we, we commission them. We actually know what's there so we can maintain them for the coming 10 years. Um, and we, we just sell them directly to the, let's say, solution provider and retrofits or the general contractor. Um, um, so there's a very short line to market uh, compared to other heat pump manufacturers who first either sell to a wholesaler who sells to uh, um, an, uh, an installer who sells as a subcontractor to a general contractor and margins being stacked every time the box gets shoveled. So that's another reason why our costs are quite competitive. Um, if you look at the value chain, um, you come from commodities, which is sand and, and steel. We make parts of that, and then we make components like compressors, and then we make a heat pump. Then we go to the subcontractor, to the building, uh, to the building industry uh, that actually builds, builds the, the projects, and then the project gets maintained. Um, so factory zero is at the edge of that process industry because we actually have a factory building machinery and the project industry because we ship them outside. And that's a bit of a complex position to be in and nobody wants to be in there uh, because on one hand, I just, I know how to build boxes and the other one says, I know how to build projects. But we need that position there. We need that actor there because otherwise nobody's kind of bridging the gap between a, black, an, a white box which doesn't fit a home and a, a project which doesn't fit the machinery. So uh, that's the reason why, why you position factory zero just there. We're doing pretty well. So uh, we started production in 2018 uh, and we doubled production over the, over, the, over the last years. At the moment we're running at a thousand ISAMs um, and have about I think 1400 installed units. Uh, we do 12 million turnover, we have 40 people employed uh, and we're running break even and as a startup we are quite, you know, we're quite uh, proud that we, that we reached this. Um, the speed of growth has mostly been hampered by the fact that, uh, that we couldn't ramp up, you know, production and our service apparatus fast enough. So it's not a matter of demand because demand is there, it's really about, you know, keeping quality up while, while, while going forward. Now, if you spend 12,000 euros, you can also buy this car. And I would say this car is slightly more complicated and has a lot more components. You know, this thing ventilates, it heats, uh, you know, it gives you music and a chair and, and, and all of that for the same price. It drives you around. Um, so basically what we're producing compared to this car is the engine of that car. And this engine will set you back a thousand euros. Now, there is no end to where cost can go if you start ramping up volumes of, of the production of heat pumps um, over time and when technology improves and improves. So if everybody, somebody says, you know, we need to make a projection for the coming 30 years, how many heat pumps we can store at the current price, you know, that's not the way to look at this. You know, once we see, once production volumes double, our prices decrease because we have, uh, you know, better procurement uh, while we're not buying boxes off the shelf anymore, but we buy OEM components, et cetera. So um, for, the next, for the next round, what you're gonna to see today is a, is a generation one product, uh, product. so, so the, the ISAM gen one. And there's also a generation one production process you're gonna see. Um, uh, and for the next, uh, the next five years, we're still looking for an investment partner 
with us who wants to join this journey in actually bringing this company from 10 to 100 million and, uh, and make, this, make this new, you know, this real new product which is integrated instead of a patchwork of different components which we buy off the shelf today. So, join me for the tour. I'm gonna to show you a short video um, to just bridge the gap for me running downstairs. And this is a typical project we do. I hope, let's see if I can start this from here. Uh, not, yeah, this will work. Here we go. place here and then how many people do you have working on the factory floor yeah so this is our second location we started out with a with a much smaller location it was like you know this garage tile uh, yeah. startup very uh, very steep jobs huh? yeah 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 <laughs> very very microsoft -y. um so we i think we now have about 12 people on the factory floor yeah um and uh, that's it's a bit dependent on how much production we do so it scales up a bit and down um but, uh, and this is kind of the second location, I would say it's a third production process. So we started producing this in a very small scale uh, um, uh, um, shed in a batch production. We moved here because the production, is, uh, production was increasing. Uh, so we used to have a lot of space here and then it cluttered down completely because the production process we had was still a batch process. So we would have a machine, people working on that and the machine would go out. And now we kind of did the first step in, in serial production. One of the interesting things that you told me before was as your production grows, or as you grow in capacity and what you can produce, your production methods change slightly. So do you want to yeah. explain a little bit about, about you know, how that's affected the space that we're in right now? Yeah. Um, so this space has been reorganized about three times now since we're here. Great. Uh, and I'll, 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 run you, I'll run you through the small production batch, uh, the small production serial processes we do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. fantastic. All right. Um, so I see that all the technical issues are solved, so uh, happy to go around. Um, we first do, do, you've seen these things flying around just in the video. Um, this is, uh, this is the, the typical external unit um, of the heat pump. It, it's on top of the roof uh, because it needs a lot of air. Um, the building integration part is about, you know, this piece of roof we put on. Um, uh, you see uh, the hoist here, and this is now cluttered around, but that will be the water, the water, um, uh, the drainage for the water from the roof. And just to, just to compare this one um, to um, another project that we're now producing, you just walk with me. So every builder, so this, this part will always be the same, um, but every builder uses a different roof panel. So we actually change the roof panels we use, uh, um, uh, we adapt that to the project. Is this roof panel one that you'd use in a renovated home and then perhaps this one is one for a new build or is there a preference? It, this, one, this, one is, this one is a new build, a uh -huh. uh, new build project. Uh, it, really, it really depends because in retrofits you have different type of panels too. Sure. So, um, and I have a quick yeah. question. You yeah. have the waterproofing layer just yeah. there that you lay out. Does that mean you can then put any sort of shingle, whether or not it would be slate yeah. or yeah. so your roofing, yeah. whatever roofing material you'd otherwise selected would still be, would still be usable? Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. yeah, and the whole idea is maybe I can ask these guys just to, uh, to, to can, I, can I just ask uh, one little question? So this, so what we normally do is we try to connect everything through one hole in the roof. So it's two pipes of ventilation. It is all the refrigerant piping for the heat pump. Um, and there's a lot of cables because the outside unit has quite a, quite a few sensors also, and it's electricity. And that is kind of all integrated into this one little box. Now, this is, I would say, the old fashioned way we did it. Yeah. In the newer panels, we have kind of a 3D cutout in the interior where we kind of r route all these pipes. Okay. So you could say that is 80% of our production right. and this is kind of really a special for one project. Okay, yeah. wonderful. And then, and then the unit itself will sit underneath 
uh, underneath that that, yeah. that hole. Yeah, so you could say it's on top now, eh? yeah. so it's, it will be on the outside and uh -huh. uh, the rest, the, the unit itself, so the, yeah. the, the rest of the unit we will see later, yeah. uh, will be underneath that. Right. All right. So this is the first little little serial process where we go from panel to uh, to a roof mounted uh, heat pump. Now if you walk here. There's lots going on. <laughs> yeah, this is um, so this is where uh, we um, we do the pre-assembly for piping and electric uh, electric uh, electric parts. Um, if you just if you just could look over there, uh, you see that all you know. A normal installer uh, will never use these kind of pre-bent pipes. Um, you see they are lying down in the in the bottom. Um, the idea is that you know you, you gain so much efficiency by just procuring those parts as they are there because this is all factory made and, and it's never never wrong. And also it disciplines a lot by using those parts because then you make every time the same. And this is really where you've been able to achieve the cost-saving benefits that you talked about before. Am I, yeah. am I correct? It, this is this is one of the fifty parts we have to focus on. So cost saving is in is in is in your piping. Cost saving is in your labor amount. So how how many hours do you actually work on the on the machine? It is in your procurement contracts. And the, the bigger you grow, the more people are willing to 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 sell you stuff at cheaper prices. And maybe this is a good example. So this is a typical this is a typical Grundfos pump. This will set you back about you know 150 euros in a retail store. Mm -hmm. This, no, I, I'm not going to tell you the price, but this can be substantially cheaper if you buy a whole box of a thousand. And then everything which you see here, once we saw that we grew from 200 per year to a thousand a year, contracts changed, prices went down, and that's kind of one of the reasons uh, you know we become more and more competitive um, uh, compared to the. Um, uh, to the normal installers. Yeah. So here we kind of fill these uh, these boxes. Um, that is kind of everything which goes into the energy module. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously each of these boxes would be for different yeah. modules. It's a bespoke. It's a bespoke energy module which is filled here. Okay. So uh, we have a few variations, as few as possible. Maybe on the other side, it's uh, this is where we kind of prepare all cabling and all the um, uh, all the uh, electric stuff. So so most of the cables we have for uh, all the sensoring and, uh, and of course, electricity supply, uh, that's all been made by these two fabulous ladies. Now, when all this pre-assembly work has been done, we actually go to make the actual module. Um, and uh, we, we, we start with the, with the boiler. Now, the this, looks, this looks like a regular, a, a regular water boiler, am I right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. So, so the way we start as, you, as a startup company, there's already so much benefit in, in just putting together the normal parts. Yeah. And when we started, we thought, you know, we just chunk five brands into a box and, and we have a business, yeah. uh, which, which was true. But more and more, it's, it's not about these brands in the box, it's actually about the box itself. So where it would be Mitsubishi, ABB, uh, Brink, Climate Systems, and an Inventum, it's now more, it's a factory zero module. Mm -hmm. And um, the, um, you know, so, so, so we're now, for all these components, we're looking at, okay, why should we procure it at this price? Um, can't we just use a stainless steel a vessel and then um, insulate it ourselves in a better way? So we're just re-engineering all those different parts at the moment. Now, um, the, next, the next stage is where all the electronics come on, and maybe it's better to look from this side, where, um, where you know, there's a lot of sensoring cables uh, and uh, added sensors we have. So for all these energy modules, we measure extra the thermal output to the house. How much hot water has been sent to the house? Um, um, the machinery itself will give us uh, how much um, uh, solar production has been produced. Um, and all that data com combined with temperatures and, and all settings is all being collected in this little computer. Um, that computer then sends it out via 4G. So each and every model is, has, has its own connection to the house. Oh, so each model doesn't rely on, say, your home Wi-Fi no, unit. No. It has its own 4G it's, connection. Yeah, its own 4G connection. So we are, have a dedicated, secure connection into that into that home. That's great. That's great. So that means that the data that is collected by you, it comes to, it comes onto your servers, and you're able to control where it goes. That's it. That's, that's it. That's it. Yeah. So from here, it's it's kind of semi-finished. It uh, it's been on stock. Then it goes through a uh, a testing, and it's interesting, kind of. 
you know, in our production process, people, people look at their physical stuff. Uh, so they see, okay, this all works and it doesn't leak. But in the end, we actually produce uh, a computer with installed software yeah. with a lot of crap around. Um, so so the, what we do here is, is mostly do all, do all data connection work. Uh, we upload, upload the software around here that kind of the controls for, let's say, the heat recovery system that it ramps up and CO2 levels go up. <laughs> all of that. <laughs> I have some background noise and somebody is running to, uh, to, the, to the machine. Good. That's all right. Yeah, We're in a right. factory. Yeah. <laughs> it's right. That's right. Yeah. That's how you know it's authentic. Yeah. 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 It's for real, you know. <laughs> um, so this is where we, where we do most of the software work uh, and, we, and we physically test the machinery. Look, as you're talking to me, I can't help but, but think the advantage, I guess, from your point of view is you're able to figure out which brands, which components work best and then fit them all together. And that's really kind of the advantage about being able to buy a system like this. Am I correct? Yeah, so every installer you would go to first will say, heat pumps I don't do. Mm -hmm. I can make more money in gas boilers. Um, but that's the first hurdle. Then just imagine you would, you would say yes. Then he will search for a heat pump provider, and you know he needs to he needs to do all kinds of engineering work to just find the right one, okay. um, and and that takes a lot of time. Then then he will probably he won't install many similar heat pumps and similar combinations of technology in that one house, and we try to combine all of that so we can actually improve on on the on the full quality and the full performance of that energy module. Yeah. Right. We just um, there's a truck coming in, um, so you will hear that. We will just go to a finished model. <laughs> yeah. Which is what you yeah. need. Mm. And then over here, you're yeah. going to take me to the final product. Is yeah. That so right? this is this is the final. This is one. Of, this is the exterior unit. What we just saw in production is all the the attic mounted unit. Yeah, so yeah. that's at the the two levels. Um, and so here we are. This is this is normally being parked in front of your house. Yeah. Um, this has been connected to walk this way um, just through this interface. So with the camera coming too, it's uh, so this is this is where all the connections from this module go into your home. So it's heating twice, hot water, cold water in, and twice the ventilator, ventilation uh, ducting and, and, and data cables and stuff. Right. Um, and that's that's essentially the plug-in part. So if you're so yeah. when this so your so your building contractor, this gets delivered. It gets placed where it needs to get placed, and then all your contractor has to do is connect the piping to it, and off you yeah. go. And even that's what we do for him. Oh wow! Yeah. So to be sure, now it's not it's not always the case. In most of the projects, we actually connect it. Okay. Um, uh, just to be sure that nothing is leaking. Yeah. Now yeah, if yeah. you go and look inside this box, um, yeah. The audience, uh, ba -da -ba -ba -ba, here it is, you know. <laughs> and this is a complete unit. This is what would get. This is what would get installed. This is what we. Well, this is what would get installed. Okay. So, um, so again, you see the heat recovery unit here, the boiler, the outside unit of the heat pump, the hydronic unit of the heat pump will be behind those uh, those uh, those ducts, and then this is kind of the the brain of the whole machine. Which uh, uh, which gives us all the data um, to uh, to analyze and to monitor and also to steer this machine. So remotely, we can just on our portal we can just say the temperature in this home has to go up, or we can say you know maybe we have an error in the heat pump and we can say reset the heat pump or all of those different things. Uh, and we're, we're still figuring out and still learning. But but I think 80 to 90 percent of all people who call who say, hey, we have an issue, mm. we can remotely solve. Wow. Now, still those 80% of people, we could have seen before, because we have the data and we have the alarms. So we're now kind of making our, our service system in a way that either when the heat pump says, I'm in trouble, that gets sent to us, yeah. that's already there, but now we just need the back end to actually you know, act on those alarms. That is installed at the moment. The other thing we're working on is that all that data, if you, if you look at that data, you can see, hey, I've learned that when the, when the boiler isn't heating up fast enough, my heat pump isn't good enough. Mm -hmm. So then we go in before even any trouble is there, but we can do kind of predictive maintenance based on all the data we have. Now, Jasper, before, um, before we turn on the cameras, you were telling me about some of the sensors that you've been able to install as well. Do you want to yeah. walk us through some of the sensors that you have on this unit, but then also perhaps explain that you can start to add additional sensors as well? Yeah, yeah. So we had a bit of a discussion about how, how does this influence a role in the home, in, in domotica and, and, and smart homes, that kind of stuff. 
Um, so in this module still we use, we use this sniffer, uh, which uh, this is the exhaust pipe from the home from the ventilation system. So everything which is in the home we sniff to yep. see what's the CO2 level, the humidity, VOCs, and, that's and the it, temperature. That's the sensor right there. That's, that's, that's the sensor we, we, let's say that's the gener generation one mark one sensor. Yeah. Um, the, what we now do is we add two sensors. So uh, this comes with a screen, as I showed you in the presentation. Yeah. That screen has another four sensors embedded in that screen. Okay. So we now see the CO2 levels, which is a combined of the whole home. So it, 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 it extracts from the bathroom, the bedrooms, and the living room. But we can now specifically see what is CO2 level in the living room. So if you have a lot of visitors, the ventilation system should ramp up yeah. um, uh, because it's in the living room. We also have a sensor dedicated in the bedroom, which is a CO2 sensor, uh, which is still uh, connected to that gateway. And we've got a sensor in the bathroom that if you take a shower and it gets really humid, that specifically for that bathroom, you want to ramp up the ventilator to, um, to, uh, and to what, have better ventilation. What's there. key is you can add more sensors. Is that, yeah. yeah. So this, uh, you know, um, we're already pretty uh, advanced in kind of looking at a lot of data. Yeah. Um, and it, you know that's that's the thing, right? So we, what we are building here is it's it's kind of a bit of an IT company because to get this whole yeah. IoT yeah. system running is quite a is quite a challenge, and to get all the data out of those machines interpretable in a in a cloud. Um, we're building a physical production company because you know to make these things is is, is still also complicated. Yeah. Um, we're building. Um, a service company. So we have three people in vans on the road and we've got another three people in vans on the road commissioning those things. So, so you know, as a startup, it's, it's, been, it's been a right uh, to get all this good. Um, uh, and uh, there, is, there is no end to, um, to adding complexity to the IT system. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the funny thing is, so we, we provide a lot of housing associations with, this, uh, with these machines. They had a question, you know, now there's a screen in the living room and people won't pick up the phone. But maybe we can just flash the screen and say, hey guys, this is actually happening. Um, so, so that screen in the home gives you an entry uh, to people, uh, which is, uh, which on one hand, you know, for privacy reasons, I don't want to use for those things. Uh, but for convenience reasons, if people like to use that in that way, it can be very useful. Yeah. And I mean, my big comment, obviously, <laughs> is the size <laughs> i mean this yeah. is this is a monster yeah. of a guy here. yeah 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 is it going to stay this big because you said gen one we're at generation one here i mean what do yeah. you want to what are we what are we going to get it down to yeah so uh, i we, we started out with building an energy module which 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 is big enough to fit all those boxes in yeah now specifically in this box there is two ventilators and a heat recovery system and some IT. And if I chunk it here, it's like this big. So this size is just the least viable product we could build. Right. Now, we already, a few parts of that, we are now building ourselves so it actually integrates in this. Right. But the bigger notion is that we are now tucking these, these, these rooftop mo modules on top of the roof. Yeah. There is no reason why this whole machine will not disappear into that roof. So if people change their roof, they just get the whole system with it. Yeah. Um, and my ideal is that's kind of where Factory Zero's future lies, is that we create a roof, and a roof is big, huh? so we've got like six meters by five meters wide, so we have all the space we need, and we have a one and a half. That roof is fully covered with PV, and it has all this, these HVAC systems inside. Integrated. And it's just a few cables and a few pipes which connect to the home, slam your roof on, everything ready. So this is going to be smaller, di not directly, but it's going to be a lot more easy to integrate in the homes. Yeah. And that is one of the most essential things in making retrofits easy, is if you make it building integrated, um, you, can, you can tag on to, if people insulate their homes, they will also change into a new heat pump system. Yeah. If people do uh, want to change the gas boiler, they actually have a good option to change their roof and actually insulate that whole roof. Yeah. Meaning that you know that you that you accelerate the changes in that home by giving a decent package which fits on each home. Yeah. And the issue is that every roof is slightly different. Eh? So so that's where we are in the balance of the project industry and the process industry. These people need to run continuously. Yeah. And doing doing kind of similar jobs. Not specifically exactly the same, but but similar jobs. So you want to have a variation in roof panel size, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera while still having enough volume 
to make a stand up. So that's kind of modular thinking. So now that you're talking about volume, you gave us a little bit of a, of a sneak into what some of your numbers are looking like. And you said that uh, the amount that you started off being able to produce 200. Yeah. What could you produce? What are the sorts of numbers that you want to see in the next two years, in the yeah. next five years, in the next 10 years? Yeah, so How big do you want to get? Yeah, so max production here has been around 10 modules a week. Okay. So that's, you know, that's, that's a lot for a year. Um, um, is that? Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's like in the four yeah. or five thousand. Yeah, four hundred. Sorry. What? Four hundred a year. No, no, it's more than I'm. Than I'm. No, sorry, it's I'm wrong. I it's that's 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 a, that's a daily production. Uh -huh. So ten a day. <laughs> ten okay, a day. Right. Yeah, that's what that's what we what we did, just with this uh, with this production facility, and it gets crowded. Yeah. But I think when we do another step in kind of lean production, uh, like we did before. We can come to let's say 5,000 in this location. We're currently running at, I think, 100, 150 a month. Um, uh, so, so we can with this, with this, what you just saw, we can go up to around 5,000. Now, taking the next step, the question is: Do you want to do this with this product? Do you first want to create a generation two, which is smaller, more compact, more affordable, and maybe even better IT-wise? Um, before you make that next step. And that's kind of the struggle we're in at the moment. You know, business is going well, so you're growing and you're, you're, you're employing people, et cetera. So, so you get kind of stuck in your, in your, in your Gen 1 product, which yeah. has been eaten a lot in the market, but you want to take, take it to the next step. And that's kind of just where we are now. Yeah, so I think that sounds like the typical story of just about every startup. At the no. moment, you were, we were talking about the service area. It's just in the Netherlands. You yeah. haven't reached out to say, you know, Flanders in Belgium yeah. or, or into Germany. Yeah. Are you planning on growing into those other markets as well? And do you think that do you think there is an appetite for this sort of product as well? Yeah. So, so just imagine that in the Netherlands, we do sixty thousand new build homes, and they're not allowed to go on natural gas. So they need a kind of machine like this, yes. or they go on heat networks, but that's very small. Yeah. Um, meaning that that there is a 60,000 unit demand just in the Netherlands, just a new build. Now, to imagine retrofits, we need to do a thousand retrofits a day, insulate, go into heat pumps, like just like run explain, a thousand a day. That's 200,000 of those types of units a year. You know, so there is there is no end to demand, mm -hmm. but the demand doesn't come if the price isn't right and if, if it's not convenient to install. So it's really a kind of chicken and egg. What we try to do is to break through that cycle yep. and make it as easy as possible for people to start installing this, ideally combining it with a roof system and, a, and, and, a, and, a, and an insulated facade system um, to really ramp up those volumes. But that means it, it means a different way of thinking than a normal general contractor or a normal installer have. And it's, it's, it's been so hard to get the existing companies to think product instead of think project and to think production instead of think people on site. Yeah. The whole business model is different. The whole way they earn money is, you know, I put another 10 euros on that guy and I'm earning money. No, yeah. you know, give that guy twice the production and then you earn money. Yeah. And that's kind of what we try to tune into. Yeah? Yeah. So I imagine you're doing a lot of work then with construction companies. That would be your, that's your main, yeah. The, yeah. That's your main client. Yeah, our main, our main uh, sales channel is construction companies uh, who are building um, deep energy retrofits or uh, or um, net zero new build homes. Okay, okay. Yeah. But are you hoping to be able to deliver this to the individual consumer soon as well? We, we deliver 10 yeah. to, to, to people who begged us to deliver. Thank you. Yeah, it's like, okay. it's, so. Do you the, have a special a special button on your website? Yeah. <laughs> no. Do you want to beg? <laughs> not, yes, no. No, we, not yet, not yet. No. Okay. No, the idea is you, you want to first develop this product, uh, product and it's a lot easier. Your, your sales channel is a lot easier if you can do 120 a piece, you know, uh, big projects. Now, I do believe every consumer has a right to buy this, uh, but I rather would do one development step further make it easier to integrate in a, more, in a wider diversity of homes um, and then, then go to market in the private market. But, but it's, it analysis that 70% of the market is private homeowners. Yeah, well, I mean, it's very impressive. It looks, it's, it's, it's certainly, it's got all of the right ticks to be future-proof, <laughs> which is what we need. And, and we heard that from the, the data metrics that you, were, that you were talking about that you get collected. Um, it's net zero, which is really important. Um, you're producing it here, and so you're creating you're creating more European jobs. So I mean, this is I imagine this is really the sort of 
the sort of uh, apparatus that we want to see in the renovation wave that we're hoping will 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 come in the coming years. It would be it would be great if, if they you know if at least there is a place for this. I, I never say just do this because the the market is all over the place. But what's the problem is that people you know this is advanced, so people normally say this is too advanced to scale. Um, and I would say be courageous and and scale what's needs to, what needs to scale yeah. and that is kind of what the ration, renovation wave should should at least have a place for that you get startup companies like us and make as many competitors as we can because we are the only one making this at the moment yeah. um, um you know so we're not afraid of competition i'm really afraid of being the only one because then we won't we won't we won't um, it won't get to a net zero or a carbon free building environment. Yeah, wow, well, I think that's a really strong message and a good message to end on that being courageous and, 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 and you're not scared, the fact that you're not scared of competition, what you're scared of is being the only one. Yeah. Thank you so much for showing me around this factory. <laughs> All right. Okay, just a second. Okay. Good morning, uh, um, everyone. I'm Serena Scotton, um, and I'm going to present you the Heat for Coal project and how we are addressing the renovation challenge. Um, first of all, the Heat for Cool project is a European funded project in the framework of the Horizon 2020 program. Thanks to these European fundings, we were able to collect six innovative technologies going through adsorption heat pumps, solar PV assisted heat pump, solar thermal collectors, heat storage, thermal energy recovery from sewage water, and an intelligent building energy management system. So when we started the project, uh, all these technologies had around a uh, TRL of around four or five, but the goal of the project is then when uh, we are going to end it. So in six months, these technologies are fully uh, ready to uptake the market and so obtaining a TRL seven. Um, in the Heat for Cool project, we, um, these technologies are considering the, um, the most advanced heating and cooling solution, both for the building and district level. Indeed, these uh, six uh, technologies have been testing in four pilots uh, in Europe. So we have uh, three residential applications in uh, Sharzov, Valencia and Sofia, and one district heating application in uh, Budapest. As I said, so we have six technologies, but a key role is uh, covered by the heat pumps, innovative heat pumps. So in this project, we have a thermally driven assertion heat pump, which is provided by our partner Fahrenheit. Um, this uh, heat pump is used for uh, the cooling part and is using the silical gel technology, which, make, uh, the, uh, which makes the unit uh, um, smaller, more compact, these imply um, an easier installation, then there are no moving parts, so this allows um, a silent operation and also there is a, a low maintenance. The, um, this heat pump is also using water as refrigerant. This is an environmental friendly uh, solution because it's not, um, and it's not flammable. Plus, uh, it can be powered by renewable sources or waste heat. Then uh, we also using the PCM storage provided by Sanamp. Uh, this uh, um, heat pump is using PCM, which is a chemical formulation which allows to absorb, store and release energy to be used for space heating, space cooling, hot water. In this project, we are using uh, um, the PCM storage only for the heating part. Um, as you can see, um, so this is the first heat pump with a direct uh, refrigerant connection to the PCM storage. As you can see in the picture, if we compare the PCM heat pump with other um, average water heaters in the market, we see that we can save up to 56% of reduction in volume. And we can also, um, there's also 40% of heat loss. Um, as you can see, this is the perfect solution. For example, if you want to use this heat pump in an apartment or in a house, because you can save space without renouncing to high level performances. This is also a unique product in the sense that it has a dual ported heat exchanger with a, um, that allows a simultaneous charge and discharge. Then 
This is the schematic of another um, water to water heat pump applied in a district heating application. So this is the schematic of the um, district heating application we are now testing in Budapest. Um, in this case, uh, we decided to um, use the wastewater as heat sources for the heat pump. <clears throat> in this case, wastewater is considered a common heat source in the sense that every city has at his disposal um, wastewater. It's considered a good heat source because it has a nearly steady temperature over the um, all um, year long. Uh, so for example, in Budapest, even though there are cold winters and hot summers, there is a steady temperature of wastewater of around 15 degrees. Uh, in this case, we are simply taking uh, wastewater it goes in a screening station, which simply separates a solid part from fluids. Then the fluids go, goes to the heat exchanger, which will then feed the heat pump, which will then increase the uh, temperature and will provide hot water to the buildings. In this case, this district heating uh, um, structure is of 12,500 square meters. He's providing heating and cooling to three uh, big buildings. As you can see, they are really different to each other. So um, we have the new market hall, which is a new building. It was built two years ago. Then we have two historical buildings. Um, so as you can see, with this uh, district heating application, we went to um, replace gas boilers for the heating then uh, going to the residential pilots we have in need for cool projects um, starting from the one that we have in Sofia here we are testing the PCM storage unit PV panels and air water heat pump uh, to provide um, the cool the sorry the heating parts in a single house in Sofia um, the house is composed of four floors and it has for apartments. Please note that uh, um, in the residential pilots, we are also installing the intelligent building energy management systems. Uh, this allows to collect uh, real time data from the sensors installed in each room and it can uh, uh, set a personalized profile and it can also establish the best uh, heating. Um, strategy, let's say, uh, performances in the house. Then we have a second residential pilot in Valencia. Here we have um, bigger buildings because it's composed of 12 apartments. In here, we are providing heating and cooling by using the adsorption heat pump, solar thermal collectors, storage tanks, and air to water head pump. Then we go to the uh, last demo site in the shores of Poland. Uh, in this case, we are retrofitting 12 apartments providing uh, um, heating via the PCM storage, PV panels, and the air to water head pump. So to conclude my presentation, um, all this we think we need for cool now, uh, we think that uh, the technologies that we are providing, um, we will uh, allow us to save the 30% of energy savings compared to the prior fitting and obtain a payback period of uh, 10, uh, 10 years. And we are also creating business models because we want to promote the replicability of, of these systems. As I was saying before, uh, now the technologies involved in these projects are um, ready to uptake the market. Um, so in, we will see in six months how uh, this will go. Just a uh, thought uh, to you uh, the clicks who previously uh, presented the factory zero. Maybe it could be also of interest for them to, in, for the future, to include maybe the PCM unit or to think about uh, interaction with the kids. This is it. If you want to know more about the project or the each technologies involved, you can um, have a look at the website. Thank you very much.
Yeah, so at the moment, the technical, one of the things that we're, that we've seen a lot of the questions that you've put through on the question and answer feed. Um, all of the technical questions, I've decided to hand them over to Jasper. Uh, so he will, be, he will be responding to your technical questions while we're speaking. Uh, we also, we had one particular question which we thought was interesting to answer. And, and while, bef while, we're, while we're getting the, the visuals up, perhaps uh, Ron, this is a good time for me to ask. We had one particular question about pricing and how you can, how you're able to develop these sorts of modules, but also other cost cutting measures, which can, which can help uh, get, get this technology installed in homes. If I'm going to the bank and asking for a mortgage, but in my rebuild and in my loan, I'm also able to say, hey, I'm going to include all of this fantastic future-proof net zero technology. Um, am I able to get, uh, is, this, is this a factor that my bank should be considering? And will that help, um, will that help increase the installation capacity? So uh, the banks typically are kind of the last one that will uh, sort of uh, take on board the innovation. So I don't think it starts there. But I think uh, what I have tried to sort of show in the, in the presentation before is you want to move people to all electric. You want to benefit from heat pumps and you want to limit the amount of sort of uh, pressure they put on the grid, whether it's actual demand or peak, peak demand. So a, a pricing signal to people that says, look, if you need a big connector because your house is pulling a lot of load in winter time, right, that costs you extra. If you pull uh, a lot of load uh, on a very uh, foggy January afternoon where it's really cold and everybody is, is pulling, that costs you extra. Um, and be, by organizing the pricing system in such a way, you give people an incentive to not pull a lot of load at times that it's expensive or not uh, ask for a huge connector, which basically, if it all adds up, you know, puts a huge strain on the infrastructure. So, um, yes, this, I mean, the, the pricing signal, both for the capacity that you need and the time of use that you need, should be part of any energy market going forward when you think about electrifying homes. And if it is, and obviously, you know, the benefits of doing the deep retrofit having able to have a heat pump which doesn't pull load at peak hours because you can play with that low temperature heating when it switches on and off a little bit, um, gives you a financial advantage. So when that's all there, you can just show, hey, my energy bill is only 20 euros a month. Uh, whereas if you do it not in a smart way, it would be 120 euros a month. And then a bank should say, okay, you know, that frees up your 100 you euros. Whatever, you can, you exactly. Can pay off you can blow off on a, on a new car. It's, or whatever. <laughs> it's an interesting point that you, that you raise there about creating this renovation boom, because obviously that is one of the goals of the European Commission. I'm not sure, have we been joined by Carlos Goldstein yet? Um, no? Uh, what about, is Julian on the line? Do you hear something? Okay. Yes, I can hear you now. Um, Julian, I think, you know, from, uh, from your point of view, is, is the renovation challenge really about how we roll out, how we can create this, this massive rollout on, on scale? And then could you also talk perhaps a little bit for what, uh, what the role of cities might be? Well, thank you very much. Uh, well, First of all, let me let me just say how, how great uh, the, the presentation was and the, and the virtual tour. I think what, what Factory Zero uh, has presented is, is very interesting because it touched upon the, the, the very, very core of the challenge, which is decarbonization of the building stock. And when we talk about decarbonization, we mean, of course, not only decreasing the energy demand, but also make sure that uh, the remaining needs will be covered by carbon-free uh, sources. So I think uh, for the social housing providers, and indeed Housing Europe, which I work for, is a federation of social housing provider. For them, what matters is decarbonization and how we, how we do that. I mean, in some circumstances, we like, as you probably know, in Sweden, I mean, the, the heat is provided by uh, district heating, uh, um, mainly relied on uh, renewable energy. Uh, but in other circumstances, indeed, the, the electrification and the use of heat pumps is, is crucial. So for us, the idea of having um, integrated and mass uh, customized solutions like the Factory Zero is, is, is crucial because there's definitely a need. And this is your question about running, running out. I mean, 
um, if I mean, some estimations say that about 30% of the social housing stock in Europe would be fit for this kind of solution. I mean, mass customized solutions. And if you know that uh, uh, probably three quarters of uh, social housing uh, is uh, in Europe is like 30 year old or more. I mean, you feel a sense of potential. Now the question is how you create the, the volume and you create the volume by uh, using the power of um, uh, public authorities indeed. So the role of citizens is important when they do procurement. So how we procure, how cities can procure and how socializing can procure in a sense that we create this, this mass volume. Um, we, we have different tools in the procurement that can help to do that, but maybe, maybe we can think about other things that can help uh, pulling together the demand with the supply. And of course, the role of this construction sector is crucial. And it's great to see Factory Zero working in the Netherlands. We know that in other countries like France, we already started to work on integrated solutions uh, similar, quite similar to the one of Factory Zero. So I think, uh, yes, there is, a, there is a potential. There are tools to create a volume. Um, and of course, now we need, particularly in that circumstances, COVID crisis, we need indeed some seed funding to, uh, to, to start the, uh, the, the project pipeline, in a way, or at least to, to make the project pipeline uh, move on. So that's, yeah, in a nutshell, the first uh, bunch of answer. So you obviously you think that this is the sort that this certainly is the sort of product which you could get you could see be deployed in social housing. You mentioned just before that most of the social housing stock is is only 30 years old, which when you look at the lifetime of housing stock, it's more or less about about 100 years could even be longer 150 years. So that to me makes it clear that we really do need to focus on um, on having uh, renovation within within social housing. Are these sorts of projects starting to spring up across the EU? Are we seeing it not just here in the Netherlands, but are you also seeing it in, in Southern European countries, in Eastern European countries? Where are these projects happening? So it's very much something in the air in a way. Uh, very recently, um, I, I had the pleasure to, to be in the jury to, to, uh, to assess some solutions related to energy strong model in France. Um, so indeed it or originated in the Netherlands, but now it's, it's spread out a bit uh, um, uh, everywhere. Um, um, France is an example, but Germany as well. So the idea is to, to have uh, solutions, integrated energy solutions, which in some, in some cases could be also renovation solutions. I mean, of course, energy strong is the integrated energy system plus the, the renovation and with pre prefabricated pre prefabricated panels. So in some, in some cases, the whole package is needed. In other cases, uh, only the integrated energy solution is needed or only the renovation uh, part, like in Sweden, as I mentioned before, where district heating is already decarbonized. So we see um, this happening also in Eastern Europe. Um, I mean, in some part of Eastern Europe, as you know, um, what we need is indeed a regulated and uh, sector, housing sector, and we need mass uh, scale. And not all Eastern European countries have this um, um, potential because there's many, uh, a lot of um, homeowners, 90% plus of homeowners, and sometimes it's not uh, easy to reach them out. So you need a country where you have this kind of regulated, collective, uh, movement uh, which will be ready to uh, to make some uh, some some take some decisions so that's why indeed Eastern Europe remain uh, a big challenge um, uh, but we see a very very we see get very good uh, projects in, in Estonia for instance uh, Estonia is really one of the leading countries on on for instance um, uh, uh, timber uh, renovation and timber new construction also using uh, modules of which are um, which are integrated and prefabricated pre so um, um, we have this um, um, running out every, part every, everywhere in Europe, almost, in, in, in the UK, of course. And this is a solution which is uh, really looked at very carefully by socializing providers. So we need flexibility, of course. It should be adapted to the local situation and local architecture. In some cases, you have the flat roof, so you, you need the module on the flat roof, not uh, exactly like the Dutch way. Uh, and in, so, in some countries, you need solutions which will be more on cooling rather than heating. In the Eastern, Eastern Europe, is is uh, an example. But the good thing with heat pumps is that it can indeed go both ways. So, um, 
that's very prom promising for the sector and we are really happy to uh, continue to, to support that also at the European level. All right. Well, in that case, one of the things I might do is I might bring Thomas in to speak to us a little bit about what the expectations of the European Commission are. We've obviously seen the European Commission has, um, has, has focused and will continue to focus on using the COVID-19 recovery as a way of future-proofing um, and reducing the amount of uh, and increasing the energy efficiency of buildings and reducing the amount of carbon that each building has. Um, what do you think, what are the real challenges for the rollout, the mass rollout of this sort of scale in the next decade for the European Commission and have they bitten off more than they can chew? Well, I think they have presented first and foremost a very thorough impact assessment and that made us very happy. We, if we're looking at this impact assessment, it shows with gr great detail how big the challenge is. But I also see that there is huge amounts of money now in the um, in the different funds that are proposed and have been proposed and that will be unrolled over the next two years probably if they're fast. So this money will be useful to, uh, to employ these shovel ready solutions that we have indicated. And I've said at the beginning that we are talking about um, 36 million buildings for sure that need to be electrified according to this, uh, to this uh, uh, background study. And if that is happening, then we will actually quite uh, luckily decarbonize the the building stock. So then the question is, how do we pay for that? And we often hear that people say, well, unfortunately, the gas and oil boilers are just cheaper. But it must not be overlooked that the fact that these technologies do not pay for the uh, external effects that they create, namely the CO2 emissions, is actually making them cheap. So society generously pays, and the individual happily benefits from that. So I'm if I'm going to be bold. Does this mean that you think that housing and buildings should be included in the EU ETS? Well, I wouldn't go that far because it is a political decision to decide which type of tool. But I'm quite sure that if we don't manage to integrate a price signal into heating and cooling, then we will not make it. Because no government in this European uh, environment or even worldwide has enough funds to just pay for the energy transition to the end user. So we need to activate, we must activate end user funding in order to to bring everybody on board. And then it's much more than that because it also provides perspective. It shows people that, oh, that could be a career. So people that don't know what to do, maybe they have a great career in building renovation, which is something good, I think, for, for a continent that is struggling at one point, point or the other with enough employment for young and old people. And we have a big transition in front of us. The whole coal sector needs to go. We have seen that the phase out is faster or slower, depending on which country you look at. But there is quite a lot of people that have technical skills. If we would give them an opportunity, I think it could be much smoother. That's, that's a really interesting point when you talk about skills, because obviously we want this to be a, a just transition. We want to ensure that, that no other people still have jobs and that, that people are still going to work. Should that be a focus area of the commission? Should they be investing in skills as well as investing in, in, in actual projects and, and, and using apparatuses like we just saw? I, I, for sure, I cannot say no to that. On the other hand, there is a question, uh, what's the chicken, what's the egg? So when, when do people upskill themselves? Mm -hmm. And I would say there is as much as the commission should do something, there is also an important point in creating a value chain that is creating demand for these type of solutions. Mm -hmm. Because then people will think, hmm, where should, I, where should I build my career? And if the career could be in the building sector into, to introducing renewable energy sources, then you will um, motivate, motivate them by themselves instead of putting it on top of them. So what I think the commission should do is, on the one hand, should create a value chain that um, entices people to become qualified in these areas, in IoT, in insulation, in building components, and so on. And then on the other hand, should create a value chain, should actually facilitate demand from the value chain so that this type of upskilling yourself makes absolute sense from a career perspective. And both things are under discussion. I know that. So uh, maybe the lack of, uh, of participation today, uh, everybody being very busy is also the reason this is caused by the reason that the commission is working on the renovation strategy, which, which is in this, in this final steps. So I really hope that the fact that we are making this useful also as a recorded video leads to recognition by those people that make, maybe can only watch it tonight. Sure. And it's well worth, I would say, to watch it tonight instead of uh, some sort of action movie. 
So I'm going to ask you. Um, I'm going to ask you to put your Parliament hat on, as if as if you were uh, from the European Parliament. What are the sorts of measures that you'd want to be that you'd want to be pushing for in the legislative agenda that we have coming up? So we have the smart uh, the the energy integrate energy systems integration strategy, which has come out. Yep. For me, that factory tour there was a big role for the energy integration system yes. strategy there. Um, if you're if you're in the Parliament, is that the sort of thing that you want the Commission to be putting in front? of you uh, where do you see the, the the where do you see the scope for regulation to to, to uh, develop which can enable more installation of these sorts of, of net zero products well the, the parliament is and has been working very much on the renovation sector and I think that work needs to continue Kieran Kauf that unfortunately uh, had to cancel his participation because of a very important meeting on exactly that topic this afternoon um, is a, a very strong proponent other MEPs uh, likewise. So I think that work has to continue. We need to address the renovation sector. We need to discuss if it's okay to simply re replace technology or if we are not at a point in time, especially when it comes to the, uh, to the climate crisis, where we have to demand more from people. When you touch your building, you should actually touch it in a way that it makes it future-proof, makes it 2050 ready. And the difficulty that we have is the slowness of the sector. People do not like craftspeople in their houses that that make everything dirty and then maybe don't clean up to, to just give you a few of all these, these myths and uh, what people fear. So if, we, if, if somebody is ready to allow uh, a craftsman, an installer into his or her building, then we should make it, we should ensure that this renovation is actually more complete than it is by simply replacing the heating technology. And on top of it, so Julian has also said that we have the problem or the opportunity, you could say, that heat pumps provide heating and cooling. Now, a lot of people are considering to install a cooling device, but that's just an add-on. And if we go one step back and say, okay, let's look at this building. How does it look like? What are the windows like? What's the roof like? Do we really need heating and cooling? But if we do so, can we then not just integrate and put something that we have seen, such a model that, we've, that we have seen today into such building? Well, I think we've had plenty of food for thought there. It's um, unfortunately we haven't been able to connect to uh, to the commission. I think one of the big takeaways from today, for sure, is that we've been able to see that we have the capacity to strengthen synergies, and that those synergies can come in a prefabricated box and be installed relatively easily, either into your home or or, or into buildings that are coming up. Um, we've been able. We're hoping that we've been able to raise a bit of awareness. I think on the sorts of technologies which are available, but of course. Of course, what we just saw was only was only one example, um, and most importantly, the technology that we've seen today has will significantly re significantly reduce the kind of upfront costs, which often become a barrier to installation, especially when approaching the energy efficiency of buildings and how we can make our buildings uh, our buildings uh, net zero. Um, Julianne, I'm going to start to wrap up. Are there any final words that you just wanted to add? Um yeah, I mean, just to, 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 to reiterate the fact that uh, what we saw today is a very, I think is a template for, for what the socializing sector is going to, to work on in the next, in the next uh, years. I mean, as, as we say, as we know, I mean, we need to decarbonize um, and electrification through heat pumps, it's a very, very interesting solutions that um, will provide um, the kind of predictable level of performance that we need in the sector. We never, we never have to, to forget that at the end of the day, particularly in our sector, the question of uh, affordability is crucial. So the, the notion of having a, a cost, uh, a predictable cost, global cost of new installation plus maintenance is really crucial. And so this kind of solutions, which are provided by um, now more and more contractors in, uh, in Europe are, are very important. And we, we, we also hope that the construction sectors, particularly SMEs, I mean, we know that 90% of the uh, work in construction sectors is done by SMEs. So uh, the, the solution to uh, mass industrialization and customization will come from SMEs rather than being companies, I think. And SMEs will also have to be supported and trained and to develop this uh, new tools with a this important level of uh, predictability and guarantee and, and, and the, the, the affordable cost, global cost of uh, installation and maintenance, which will help the socializing sector to then having what we call a fair energy transition. But I'm very hopeful that uh, with the, the example of today, we will, we will manage that. 
That's a great final word. Thomas, do you have, do you have some final words that you wanted to add? I do that? have a few. I need to thank everybody for making it possible today, um, Ron and Jasper in particular, but I, there is a huge team that you don't see on camera behind it. I mean, again, for coming uh, the long way, all the participants online, we had more than 200 registrations and I saw on the peak, I didn't check all the time, but I saw on the peak 160 people uh, participating and we will see how many other people will look at this. I think what, from my perspective, what makes, it, makes me really optimistic for the future is on the one hand, this industrialized mass scale renovation solution give us an opportunity to accelerate the deployment of uh, heating and cooling renovation. That's one. You have asked on the parliament. I think the parliament has created a huge, huge batch of very, very um, focused and contributional pieces of legislation. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen has mentioned that now they need all to be to be uh, opened again if we get the 55% CO2 emission, retar uh, emission redu reduction target. And I think that is a very important thing. This needs to go through. We need that ambition level um, in order to renovate buildings, in order to get more renewable energy into the building sector, especially into heating and cooling, um, in order to improve the energy efficiency also in industry and in district heating systems and, and everywhere heat pumps can play an important role. Then integrate all of this with the electric grid. You may know that EHPA is also part of this electrification alliance. So there is this elect the efficient electrification of the building sector is a beaut will is ensures a beautiful future in my opinion. And we have the technologies available that allow us to increase the ambition level. That would be my message to all the policymakers. That don't let yourself be stopped by those people that say we can't do anything. What we have seen here today is that we can do much more than we think with existing technologies. And that, I think that's an important message that we have. We have the sorts of technologies yeah. that can help us reduce our upfront costs reduce the complexity of renovation, and most importantly, reduce emissions. Um, I'll end on that note. I'd like to thank you all for participating today. Uh, we'd like to thank Jasper and his team here at Factory Zero, and of course, uh, Thomas Novak and the wonderful team at the European Heat Toms Association. A big thank you to Ron as well and his team at Energy Schrog. Um, uh, so um, I wish everyone a great day, and I hope that you've enjoyed the content that we've been able to come up with. Take care. Thank you very much. Goodbye.